recently we've been in, we've been investigating like how Twitter is being used in Kenya, for example, and we realized that there is actually some paid pundits. We call them paid pundits because these are people that advertise for payment uh, for amplifying pieces of content. It isn't a crime, of course, to look for money and, and basically do that. The challenge is when you do that in an inauthentic way. So at the end of the day, that then becomes something we call influence operation. So a thousand percent, there's still foreign interference on some level, because we've seen, uh, we were talking, uh, I was talking to Alan about this earlier, about how you see a phrase and you're like, this doesn't sound like Kenya. it came from like yeah. a Kenyan, and then someone somewhere will backtrack and like bring it together and like this was formulated by some corporate somewhere and now it's like a general speak or like something that's either trending or just being regularly used that will not stop mm -hmm. i will probably make this a hundred percent good worse. morning good afternoon good evening from wherever you're joining us from and welcome to tech for peace africa and authentic by Magoma. my goodness i'm excited to have you guys again on this platform karibu nisana so today we're back to addressing info the issues around the information space. And I have an expert and one person who's a creative and is doing phenomenal things on digital platforms addressing these issues. So the expert is the gentleman on that end. The creative is here, but also an expert in her sector. Is it right to say that? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you guess? I think you're an expert. I feel like so far... You have so many I've followers. Tried, I've tried not to make a lot of mistakes so i think that helps the intentionality bit yes i like that Absolutely. and we're going to look at um emerging technologies and digital platforms and how they're influencing advocacy and awareness creation or rather how people are leveraging them for advocacy and awareness creation across africa but first of all we're going to start with getting to know who our guests are karibu nisana Hi, Alan. Hi. You introduce us to me. Hi, Alan. You want to tell us your other name? Yeah, yeah, so my name is Alan Chaboy. Uh, I'm currently working with an organization called BuildUp. I'm the data and digital technology lead. Uh, that basically means uh, I explore the internet. Yeah, And the internet is where I work every single day. Uh, from a research perspective, that is trying to understand how people use the internet, uh, and also trying to figure out how online harm can actually result from the use of the internet. Uh, I previously worked with uh, an organization called Code for Africa, and I think that's where, you know, majority of the people know me from, from like this particular topic, uh, where I was leading a team of data analysts to just basically do research on misinfo, disinfo, and the whole information integrity aspect of it. So it's a pleasure being here. Thank I'm you happy for to have you. Ten years later, I've known you there for long, <laughs> yeah. but I'm happy to have you here. And now the lady, you're a comedian, but you use your platform in such amazing ways. I mean, all. My name is Justine. I'm a stand-up com comedian and a political satirist and a writer. Uh, at least that's what's on my bio right now. <laughs> um, that's what I've done for the last six, seven years. Uh, full time. I think the last four. Uh, for five years um i went to school for art which was really smart at the time i just thought yeah i'm gonna be an artist and then that didn't work <laughs> and it wasn't um it wasn't until i got the job that i quit and the environment that i was in where i was like this is not working for me and there were a lot of labor law violations so i was like if I don't understand the labor laws in this place, how many other people also don't understand? And I'm supposed to do a little research on that and like make a comedy video on it. And I never got to do it, but I, I started doing comedy around that time as an escape from my job. What's your perspective on how people consume information? Do you think Kenyans, Africans, the general netizens are intentional consumers of information? Are people looking for information because this is what they want to consume because it's what is credible or just they get slapped by anything and everything a lot of younger people i'll say are very intentional about what they consume um most of it happens in little groups like if you follow one person and your friend follows that person it's like a point of convergence you can discuss that information that you just found out and 
co-creation where someone sees something that they found interesting and they split it into a whole different content format that's very very popular in how people consume and share information i really like that you say one person might be following person x so let's say i'm following you then i tell my friends that hey have you seen xyz and this is what we end up talking about but now i learned to you being the expert in the space do you feel like these people intentionally select people who are dispersing their credible information because it's, a, it's one thing for me to decide that i'm gonna follow justina i'm gonna follow you and your point of reference for whatever happened in let's say the process in mano mano that being a very current affair in the country is it that we are necessarily talking about our point of reference is the person who's spreading credible information just because we like them mm -hmm. I think for me, based on what I've seen and what I think, it's it's mostly starting with the content because majority of the people online will f try to find what they like. And that is how, why like uh, uh, social media platforms have algorithms. Basically what that means is that they start from looking at what content interests this person and then they feed you more to that. Traditional media is where you just sit down and watch a TV and most of the time they just feed you what they want you to see. Yeah. So I feel like the current generation and especially the young people, we are more intentional about what we want. And that is why, you know, social media platforms and other digital platforms are actually customizing it to address what you want. And in terms of now determining who to follow, I think that then becomes based on the interest and the content that you want because the more you see a certain piece of content the more the algorithms actually know that ah, this person is interested in this then shows you more people that produce that type of content then then you're able now to follow the specific people that you want unfortunately one of the key things i know right now is that uh, the algorithms kind of show you content based on engagement and what that means is that the more that content is engaged that the, the more it's shown to more people and sometimes that that can be harmful content yeah. so yeah uh, then at the end of the day uh, it's very hard for you now to disassociate between i want only credible information uh, because automatically the platforms are designed to actually feed you what is engaged what is most engaging right yeah. so yeah i think that is how i see it we are more intentional but there are risks and of course at the end of the day advantages to the algorithms so one thing that uh, we've been trying to think through is and there's a lot of people who are actually doing some research on that is how do we drive engagement based on quality of content so there, there needs to be two metrics where engagement is one thing which is good like the more engaging the more uh, that content is short but also the quality that is why like uh, you know there's a lot of talk about cloud chasing because you use controversial topics to get gain a lot of con uh, engagement then the engagement benefits you by being short but then if the platforms are designed to start by looking at is there is this content quality enough for us to now start amplifying it to other people i think that will help yeah okay thank you and now we have the expert in terms of the creative bit and the quality of content how did you end up using both satire and comedy and what has been the journey uh, what has the journey been like for you because we are seeing a problem with us who are just creating and sitting and having conversations you actually use comedy and communicate to people very effectively and what's your advice to other creators um <clears throat> let's just say i i got very lucky because i think most of the times people uh forget just the kind of luck that plays into even your content moving to different spaces so on tiktok it was much easier to navigate because the algorithm kind of just sends out your content to anyone and then if people resonate you will try it will try help you curate an audience at least initially yeah. i don't know about the algorithm right now um but instagram was very different because i would upload a video that i've researched and i have it is the best jokes I could write and then it just stunks. It gets like two hundred views and I was like, That's enough for me today. I don't wanna feel crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very happy even if I got two hundred views because I felt like at least there's people watching even if it's just my friends. Yeah. Um and then there's a time when one of the creators, I think not a creator, it was an actor I knew from a while back that he was on TV and he used to make very niche comedic shows. He saw my content and he reposted it. And that's how I got like my first wave of followers on Instagram. Oh. Where it's like 
someone just someone sharing it with someone else created like a um traction traction yeah. yeah and then after a while people who were a little skeptical about like what they were seeing would slowly like come to my platform it wasn't an easy <laughs> an easy build like the first few years were horrendous i used to shoot the content all the way wrong i would put it in um landscape mode and then that time instagram changed the profile to like accept more reels and stuff like that so i had to switch the format i had to get like the right software to edit to subtitle subtitling can make you crazy because it takes forever yeah. <laughs> and now a lot of the caption software also um requires you to pay and if you don't have the resources it it just becomes like a pocket mining kind yeah. of it takes a, a lot of resources for you to get from a to b but um i'll say building it was not simple and it wasn't straightforward but i say doing comedy is like a it's like a blessing yeah. because you you learn to listen mm -hmm. before you put out anything you learn to listen and like how would i would i find this joke funny if i wasn't there like mm -hmm. so, um alan you've worked not just in kenya but the african context what are we seeing in East Africa? What are we seeing in West Africa? Um, with how guys are consuming information, is it that Kenyans might prefer a certain format, like she's saying, uh, well researched, pro uh, presented as comical, in comparison to what people are doing in Nigeria, and who do they prefer to consume from? I think it's it's different depending on context. Uh, I think for Kenya and also the platforms are quite different uh, yeah. and for different purposes uh, at the end of the day. So generally what we see across the board is that a lot of people generally use Facebook, which is interesting. Really? Yeah, which is an interesting start. I am I even, <laughs> <laughs> I even I'm, I was even surprised because any analysis we've done in, in terms of social media usage, it's basically Facebook that comes at the top. Is there a particular uh, reason? Is it a certain age? I think it's because it's generally used across the board. So if you talk about Twitter, it's mostly elites and like young people and people who want to voice a lot of issues. Can I lie in the elites? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in their own <laughs> capacity. But at the end of the day, it's it's kind of like a very small subset of people. Uh, a lot of people on Twitter will will just you know read through, yeah. like they're mostly consumers. Uh, uh, but on Facebook, everyone is a creator most of the time. There are spaces in like, for example, the Sahel. If you talk Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Niger, uh, and like Senegal, all the Sahel region, a lot of people are actually on Facebook as compared to like uh, Twitter or Instagram or, or, or TikTok. Uh, so that's one of the things. So the platform really matters in terms of consumption. The other thing is in terms of content, I think there are similarities, right? Uh, dance content <laughs> gets a lot of traction yeah. either way. Like in Kenya, I've also done some research recently uh, in Somaliland. Uh, Somaliland have elections in November and you are looking at the type of content that, you know, people produce for us to be able to kind of look at how to respond to issues that you are seeing online and dance becomes like a major component of it uh, in nigeria and kenya we are we have a lot of similarities because tiktok is really really huge yeah. uh, similarly to like instagram and uh, facebook also is, is right there uh, but yeah in terms of content it's mostly the same so i would say maybe the francophone speaking region of africa has some different qualities in what they consume as com compared to like the Anglophone region of Africa. So that's kind of one of the key differences that I've seen at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in terms of people that they follow, uh, yeah, so I think that also differs because my research has been quite specific. So I wouldn't say generally because in each of these countries I've done research in, my research has been quite, quite specific to different topics, mostly election focused, uh, and then also looking at like religion as an example, as a driver of conflict and then foreign interference. But most of the time, when you look at a specific topic, then you don't see the general overview. So I wouldn't say majority of people in a country will follow X, because if I look at a specific topic, I will only identify people who follow 
X in, a, in that particular topic. Yeah, so I wouldn't say generally I would have an idea, but politicians are mostly followed across the board. Then there's influencers. So. Still on the political, now that we are there, we have been seeing some form of movements and revolution, yes. starting with Kenya and what we're seeing with the protests. And digital platforms generally, as well as emerging technologies, have been critical in mobilizing change. Justin, do you think we can sustain that? Now that we are moving into AI and now from you as an expert, what's the role of emerging technologies with mobilizing change? Because now we're talking about foreign interference. Sometimes, actually not sometimes, people have said, your president included, has said that um, there's foreign interference. We've seen the same uh, sentiments in Uganda with Museveni. People are going apparently going to the streets because they're being funded by foreign actors. Are people just angry? And that's why they want change, or is there foreign interference? Are these platforms critical? What do you guys think? I think most of the times when we watch people in power speak, there's a general dismissal of like what's happening daily to people. I'll say these protests did not just stem from some guy giving a bunch of people money. It's not even possible because right now, even when there's no media focus, the people are still just showing up to protest. Yeah. There's a group of kids who are protesting the crossing of the Woodley Stadium. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it seems like a small protest, but that's a very big point of concern for a lot of kids in Kibera who go there to play. Yeah. And when you say, when the president says, I'm addressing your issues and I'm listening and you can just see across the board, most of the people are not catered to. So a thousand percent, there's still foreign interference on some level. Because we've seen, uh, we were talking, uh, I was talking to Alan about this earlier, about how you see a phrase and you're like, this doesn't sound like Kenya. it came from yeah. like Kenya. And then someone somewhere will backtrack and like bring it together. And like, this was formulated by some corporate somewhere and now, it's like a general speak or like something that's either trending or just being regularly used. That will not stop. Mm -hmm. AI will probably make this 100% worse, especially if people really learn how to use mid-journey and manipulate video and all this content that people consume on a daily that accelerates something. There's also people who use older videos and then they make it look like it was shot yesterday. So that is not going to stop but also there has to be a clear line drawn at least for the people in power where it's like the addre addressing people's concerns does not stop at this foreign interference because if you don't fix those issues whether ai exists or not those people are still going to keep showing up yeah like their their voices matter even if the people in power don't listen yeah. Yeah. i agree what do you think Alan? I think for me, I look at it both from a positive and negative perspective because at the end of the, the day, technology is an enabler, and, right, for everything that we see. Starting like with the Kenyan protests, uh, technology played a huge role in terms of the convening power, right? We are lucky that that is happening because traditionally, if you were to watch TV, it's only probably the politicians who will be able to call for a protest. So or one go, one. Or one is <laughs> one, yeah. yeah, so where they will go probably using their, you know, their, their, their resources to basically make sure that everyone can come to a protest. But right now, anyone, even you, me here, just seated here can actually start a protest on a, on a particular issue. Uh, cause I saw like there are people who are even developing like GPTs, like chat, chat GPT, basically the GPTs online where you can ask it questions about corruption. That is awesome. Like if we do more and more of that, because a lot of government records are public. Yeah. Like if you, me just wanted to see what type of procurement has been done over the last six months by the Kenyan government, we can, but we don't do that. Uh, because there are limitations to how probably we will be able to do that. But now with the advancement of technologies, it's becoming very easy for us to basically identify any type of corruption that happens in government and hold them accountable. Use digital platforms to call for, you know, uh, accountability and all that. So I think it's an enabler and it's a really powerful thing and I would advocate for it to be used more and more for good and for positivity. But also it's on the negative side. There's also a lot of negative uh, impacts of 
the technologies that we use. So recently we've been in, we've been investigating like how Twitter is being used in Kenya, for example, and we realized that there is actually some paid pundits. We call them paid pundits because these are people that advertise for payment uh, for amplifying pieces of content. It isn't a crime, of course, to look for money and, and basically do that. The challenge is when you do that in an inauthentic way. And what that means is you're hiding who you are. You're not like using your own profile and your own face to do the advertising or where you're creating multiple accounts and then pretending that this is a popular narrative, yet it's just three people seated in a room using 100 Twitter accounts to try and amplify, amplify content. So at the end of the day, that then becomes something we call influence operation because you're trying to influence the masses of a narrative that is non-existent or is not getting organic traction. So Justin, Justin just mentioned about uh, the, the the element of uh, there's someone who can tweet and you know, this is not a Kenyan, yeah. right? But with the advancement of how AI is going, even like the, there's, a, there's a way someone seated, for example, in Russia or in China or in the US, can craft content if you have like a hundred accounts that you have and you craft some pieces of content and you tell the AI make it the lingo to be Kenyan. Yeah. Then we wouldn't be able to identify that, right? But that's even much more harmful because then someone seated even way across the world is trying to influence decisions and policies in a country where they don't even reside and it could be from a negative lens, right? So at the end of the day, there is positivities, there is negativities to it. It's just a balance of how do we create regulation to enable us to counter more of the negativities, uh, like, and of course, not uh, deter the positivities of where these technologies are leading us. So how do we create a citizen, a citizenry that's aware and vigilant about what they're being told? What to Nairobi, to Najoku verify, to Najoku after the right sources, but that is not Kenya, that is not Africa. If we're looking at the African context, it is guys in the villages, it is guys, Mama Mboga, they need credible information. So, how do we ensure that they are vigilant about what they consume? I think information is out there, uh, that's one thing I know for sure. Uh, so. The main thing usually is it's not in a format that is easily consumable by the, 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 the normal person just you know walking down the street. Uh, and that is why it takes the media, for example, to go and find documents and read them and explain it in detail for people to understand. Uh, so one of the things that I think uh, could be done is that uh, a lot of this information should be made more available uh, from the government, of course, from the government side uh, uh, in the first place when it comes to government issues. But generally, a lack of information creates a lot of disinformation. Like when there's a vacuum of information, things will pop up. So at the end of the day, information should actually be made available in a way that is more consumable by the public. But also the public, also it's our responsibility to find that information, sometimes I feel, because I think sometimes, you know, just a simple Google search will give you a lot and people don't, don't usually do that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and like if you talk about the finance bill as an example, the finance bill, if you did a Google search, you'd find it, but it is in a format that you can't understand. The language, yeah. First of all, the language, it's in your legal, like heavy legal lingo, so you can't even like read it. Even me personally, uh, there are things that I had to like, you know, call my friends and, what does this mean, right, in the finance field? And it's because of that. So I, I think for now, one thing that I've loved about the society we're living in, and I think we would we would want to motivate more of that, is we need to have people who can kind of find this content and explain it in more detail to a local person. There's this Instagram channel where there's a, a group of Kenyans who are... So you, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And they were basically explaining the finance bill in local language. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome initiative. Like, if we had more and more of that, then my, my mom back at home, who probably, or my grandma back at home, doesn't speak English, would then be able to consume that easily and know, ah, okay, this is the reason I want to fight against or for this particular issue, right? Uh, same thing to any 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 pronouncements. Governments are usually like, let's do a press statement, eh? and the press statement is so heavy in terms of this is what we are doing, this is what we are doing, and yeah. But what if we had like a, an institutions where they make this information available in different formats, or they find 
creative who can expound on that a little bit more, right? In, in different formats that are more easily consumable. To your point, <clears throat> in making information more consumable, I think there's also like an assumption that a lot of people who are um, in rural areas do not understand what's going on. Yeah. Did you understand what was in the finance bill? No, no, I'm saying like usually. Um, <coughs> That's usually the assumption. Yeah. Because sometimes when, because we have to remember in villages there are people who are like, they study various different things and they're always having discussions in their houses, in their community bazaars, in all these different spaces that we don't get to access. Yeah. So when something fishy comes up in the larger circles of the government, I'm pretty sure those people are in those spaces. Maybe the disbursement of the information is not as popular and as it doesn't catch fire as, as, as fast as it should. Yeah. So maybe <clears throat> having those people engage in more town halls, more social spaces will really bridge that divide so that people are not dependent on like what the media is doing. It's just that they know if they go to this particular space, they'll get credible information. If they need any answers, if they need any clarifications, they can actually access someone who can assist. Yeah. So, and also radio, because it's, I think, the mm. most yeah. popular media up until now. Classic one of five. <laughs> <laughs> it would really, really bridge if uh, if there was ways to for the civil society groups and everyone working in that space to tap into radio as a traditional format and to help with translation for the vernacular languages, that would really help even with breaking down stuff that will obviously become misinformation because then someone who's listened to a credible source, they'll be able to counter that they're like what you're saying is not true yeah. because this is what it says, this is what this chapter says, this is what this particular article says. But I, unfortunately, as it stands now, a lot of those spaces do not overlap. So you find maybe this person has the right information and their friends have the right information, but not everyone that they yeah. know does. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Now, as you consider it, what is your advice to creatives looking to be big, to grow? Mm -hmm. Because one thing for sure, as you said initially, it takes resources, time as a resource, money as a resource, probably even getting equipment to create good quality content that is credible and publish it. And as Alan said, the guys publishing inauthentic content are getting paid to do that. You are not making money. <laughs> so Sisi Kama, credible sources of information, creators, please advise us, not only like Ushikilia, <laughs> being credible sources of information. Because it's difficult. You're looking at, am I going to eat at the end of the day? Are my children, if I have kids? going to eat at the end of the day would i rather be a platform that shares negative information fake news disinformation and get paid for it or be a trusted platform for others um <coughs> i don't know how not how not to tell people not to be sources of misinformation if they're making money because like because <laughs> chasing that bag is difficult like all of us are out here yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. make money <laughs> <laughs> but i say if you're a creator don't give up <laughs> i know it's basic advice but uh there's something that kipchoge said that i think i carry until this day um uh, it's you have to be able to be disciplined enough for it to forego your emotions so that you're not just being driven by your passion. Because like a lot of people start creating content because it's my passion. I want to talk about tech. I want to talk about these things. And then after a while, every single thing that you thought it would be able to give you, that doesn't happen. It seems further. Yes. How yeah. do you continue on when yeah. the things, the dream that you had doesn't hold how do you cross that desert to the other side? Yeah. So um, Kipchoge's advice was like, when you're disciplined, you're no longer a slave to your passions. Yeah. So when the passion you have for the thing stops working because you're disciplined and like every week you're recording yeah. something, you're editing, even if it's just like one video because that's what you can manage. And then maybe you split it into more content so that it, it feels like you've drawn it out. Just keep doing it. Yeah. And then also create things that you love <laughs> because you don't want to be a misinformation channel. Yeah. 
yeah. what if you grow a conscience overnight and you have to continue creating this information? Yeah. How are you supposed to live with that? I'm and waiting maybe for the president to grow a conscience. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to go from point A to B if you're just driven by hoping that tomorrow you'll wake up and everything is good. Because I personally do not know if what I'm doing is going to amount to anything. <laughs> Because a lot of people see and they're like, just really have so many followers. And that is me. You guys, don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, Most of the times, I'm, like this entire week, I did not put out any videos. That's the, the week that starts with the 28th. Not a single video. Today's Wednesday. And I'm just like, eh. <laughs> I really can't do anything. Because I'm taking some time for myself for a mental health check. And then build back up again. But that's understandable. Yes. Everyone makes that and deserves yeah. that. So that's also like part of the advice. You you can keep running on fumes, hoping that it will amount to something. But I just I feel like keep in tune with yourself, because if you're not in a good space, I don't think it will be able to translate in the work that you do, and even the audience that you that enjoys your work so much will probably feel like it's difficult to continue on with the journey with you because they feel like maybe they're putting some kind of pressure on you to keep creating. Yeah. So, yeah, just don't give up on yourself. Uh, be as disciplined as you can and love what you do. I honestly do not have any more advice beyond this point because sometimes I don't know what I'm doing myself. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I trust me. Make, I get that more than you know. <laughs> You're just winging it and hoping for the Absolutely. best. But you keep on going with it. Yes. Now, Alan, as the expert in the room, what's your advice for diverse stakeholders, be it CSOs, be it researchers, working on protecting the information space, but also acknowledging that um, we need a more informed society and we need resources put into now creatives as potential, credible uh, points and sources of information. What's your advice to them in your parting shot? Yeah, I think... Uh, one thing I know is that for the last like one year that I've, that I've been in this space, there's been a recognition on what creatives can do, like in, especially when it comes to the information environment uh, in terms of like basically both addressing the harms, but also being a, a, what do you call it, like someone who can actually uh, influence for positivity, right? So, um, and maybe just in terms of the stakeholders of course civil society is doing a lot but i don't think uh, reporting uh, they are <laughs> i don't think it's in the format that civil is, society is, is writing reports. yeah we write a lot For of donors. reports <laughs> let's be, let's that's be one real. of the key things uh, yeah that actually that's one one of the things that are, are actually advocated for so recently during the elections uh, the, the last elections of course, there was a lot of CSOs that were basically looking at the issue of misinfo, disinfo, malinfo, uh, and influence. And the end product for most of those projects were reports, as you say. Yeah. No one reads those reports. We tried something a little bit different. I think you know Shujaz, right? Yeah. Shujaz, the, the organization. So while I was at Code for Africa, we partnered with Shujaz uh, from a funding by UNDP. And one of the things that we, 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 we actually ended up realizing is that creating, using, and I should just had a network of youth ambassadors, so people on the ground. Uh, we also had a partnership with AI Influence in the past, uh, and AI Influence basically have a network of influencers who would, uh, who would then be able to act as, uh, you know, advocates, right? So when the CSO like ourselves, for me, I'm a, I'm a researcher mostly, so... What we would do is we research the online space, we find a popular narrative that is trending that could be harmful or could result in conflict in one way or another. Uh, and then once we identify that type of information, we don't write reports, you know. We basically then explain what we are seeing to like the networks of people. So the influencers, the youth ambassadors, and all these other people, we show the evidence of what's happening in the online space. Then they find their own voice of how to explain that, right? Yeah. And, and tell their, their audiences, actually, that thing that you saw is not, is not really factual. It might drive us into this and this. And that would prove to be really, really awesome because that kind of chain of pipeline of like, because sometimes also creatives would put out content without any informed 
like anchor yes yeah. so because you need to anchor your 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 your, your content to something that is actually happening right yeah. so sometimes creatives would not like you can't just go and say we need to have peace yeah, like that is a very general statement yeah. but if we find for example that you know uh, there is a lot of content that is missing for around this particular issue and then you talk about it it's much more impactful right uh, and that then drives a lot of understanding and peace at the end of the day so that that pipeline or that chain uh, in terms of analysis that leads to advocacy that was particularly very important and powerful. So I would advocate for more and more of that to happen. And that then seals the gap of, say, for example, creative ha creatives having to basically, you know, use a lot of their own pocket resources to basically put out some of the most impactful content, right? Because there is limit to that, right? Like there's, like, there's a limit you can go that you can't cross. Yeah. For example, if we found that, for example, producing animations, Right? animated content or like comic content or satirical content like resonates a lot with audiences especially like in Kenya as mm -hmm. an example but creating those pieces of content is not easy and yeah. it's really really resource intensive right so for the NGOs for governments for like different actors in this for the donors as an example different stakeholders we need to be investing in such type of talent right basically empowering them to make the information that we write in reports <laughs> much more consumable, uh, easily consumable to the, the, the people, the audiences that really matter, right? Yeah. So I think that is one way of doing it. And I think that is the strategy that we need to be thinking about at the moment for all stakeholders involved. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming to this platform. Yeah. I give my guests the chance to ask me a question if you have any. No pressure. <laughs> as, a, as a creator, for like tech consumers and, and suppose that's the work that you what is like a like a barrier that if it was gone today you feel like more people would be able to um to use the work that you do to impact their daily lives mine are two mm -hmm. one how to inspire and we are now seeing it agency and avoid the report publish and that's it so guys should feel like i want to consume see, when i ask some of these questions i'm looking for answers myself <laughs> see at yeah. i'm also trying to figure out because i will also probably write a proposal for a grant uh, giver you know how can i get people to want to address issues that affect them deeply and not be swayed because we are seeing, we've seen the wave of demanding change and movements and protests and guys showing up the street. And all what we're seeing is politicians trying to sanitize themselves. And when I started these conversations, uh, once I came back from the US, because my report was on what have been the failures of CSOs and organizations and creators. Because we see a spike in wanting change, then it dies off. Guys suddenly tend to go back to factory settings. And... Them, they've given up on what they actually would need and want. They can't hold these people accountable. So if people were intentional about what they need to consume, about what they want, that will make it easier for anyone working in these spaces. For me as a creator, for probably both of you as a creator and as an expert in the sector, to give this information to the people. But now where we're working from it, please kujani kusho kweli, you know, like, please listen to me. Please listen. I am telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. And yesterday when I was watching Softy, I could relate to Boniface Mwangi when he was vying for him. Please, I read him. Because it was uh, shown in the video. He's going to tell a couple of guys, Nataka mni elect. Because nita wafanyia ina, ina, ina. And for real, me think that guy would actually do what he was saying. And then the guys at the soccer are like, ah, sisi ni wanani, his <laughs> opponents. Because they've been given money. It's as if you like the pain or you want the pain of having to deal with bad governance so it would make it so easy if people were if people cared enough about themselves and not about mtu wetu or who is representing me because of class it should be more values governance perspective leadership capacity i think that would be very easy for us but i mean that would mean we have no job because then if everyone else could do it, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has, would find new problems. Yeah, to exactly. <laughs> the problems are very water like they're very they just morph into something else. So yeah. you'll always be needed. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, and tech platforms. Tech platforms need to do a thing about the algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe also my question is more aligned to like what strategies are you kind of considering, especially as a creative, to make it uh, like more appealing for people to listen to such conversations? So like, what what has worked for you so far? Like, and what do you think in the future you need to do? And what are the limitations that make you not able to actually achieve that? So, money, uh, money, and more money. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so three things, strategies, the one that I have recently found out about, having two people is better than one because then it feels less like a lecture. So that's why I was intentional about getting you both at the same time. That is one thing I discovered because then whenever someone is consuming the information, it's not just one point of yeah. view. Um, in terms of future strategies, based on the research that I conducted, to inspire agency, um, throwing a question to people, for instance, if we went to a university, and we had debates and we threw a question like um, foreign interference in Kenya is affecting good governance and financial stability for the country and get young minds or young people, the youth who are actually greatly impacted to go and research about it, then come debate and have an incentive for them. For instance, there's an award, everyone's doing something or there's going to be a fellowship for you at the end of the day after a month and make it competitive. People will care more. This will, yes, yes, this will become a dining table conversation at their household rather than forcefully feeding information to them through training and workshops. Mm -hmm. So I think CSOs, everyone else really needs to move away from that. We need yeah. to move away from, here's a training for you. Here's a workshop for you. One week training. Hit yeah. <laughs> Good report for yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. Because it becomes so difficult for the TOTs, the guys who've been trained, to take back that information and implement in their circles after those trainings mm -hmm. that is resource intensive that is why i have tech for peace africa registered as an organization right now because for me to implement that it means giving people money because i'm asking them for their time it means getting them people who can support them in their debate process a mentor probably on public speaking it's i believe the better solution but a long-term solution because what we have is crash programs. Here's a training, go home. Me, come into, here's a 20 minute video, go home. Then you go back to factory settings and we have the same problem for the next 10 years. Yeah, yeah. true, true. So many papers, huh? This is, <laughs> it's a good page. <laughs> money this, is, this is not working, give me money. I show you, I show you what <laughs> will work. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure. Okay. Guys, um, thank you for watching this. If you've stuck around till the end, uh, do subscribe, like, and share. I hope you picked something from this. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What do you feel like was not addressed and would you rather see on this platform? Comment section or my email at magomachristine at gmail.com. So because we have a creator here, we must also go and follow her. What's your... <laughs> <laughs> So I have two handles on my personal page. It's at Justin Wanda. Wanda is W A N D A. And then my satirical platform it's Equal to Justin across all platforms. You should especially follow that. Yeah. Amazing <laughs> content. Yeah. We're to follow Alan. If someone is interested in the research, <laughs> like knowing what's happening specifically to use for you know whatever you're doing. Yeah, definitely. I mostly use LinkedIn, so <laughs> <laughs> Alan Cheboy, if you just search Alan Cheboy on LinkedIn, you'll find me, but I'm also on X as Alan underscore Cheboy. So you can follow, we can interact, we can have a conversation, yeah, explore options. Okay, great. Go follow them right now. Bye-bye. Have a good one.